Hi guys, let's continue reading June 2020 Current Affairs from Vision IS. Uh, this will be the next section on the international relations. So let's pick up the first topic that is India-Australia relations. So why was this in news? Recently, the first ever virtual bilateral summit was held between Prime Ministers of India and Australia. Key outcomes of this summit elevated the bilateral strategic partnership to comprehensive strategic partnership. Elevated the 2 plus 2 engagement to the level of foreign and defense ministers from secretary level. So earlier it was in the secretary level and now it is in the foreign and defense ministers level. Where strategic discussions will be taking place every two years. India already has such mechanism with USA and Japan. So, Memorandum of Understanding or MOU on cooperation in the field of mining and processing of critical and strategic minerals. Mutual Logistics Support Agreement was signed. Joint Declaration on Shared Vision for Maritime Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific Reason. Overview of India-Australia Relations Now let's come to the background of the India-Australia Relations. During the Cold War period, Australia was the United States' closest ally, while India opted for NAM, that is, non-alignment. The end of the Cold War and launch major economic reforms in 1991 provided the first positive move towards development of closer ties between the two nations. Uh, this could not last long as India's nuclear status outside the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and PT resulted in Australia taking a particularly strong stance against India's 1998 nuclear test. In 21st century, with the changing global scenario, Australia looked at India as an important partner in promoting regional security and stability. This led to upgradation of bilateral relationship to a strategic partnership, including a joint declaration on security cooperation in 2009. Economic and Commercial Relations Bilateral Goods and services trade between two was $30.3 billion in 2018-19 and the level of two-way investment was $30.7 billion in 2018. In 2018, Australia announced implementation of an India Economic Strategy to 2035. A vision document to shape India-Australia bilateral ties. India is also preparing an Australia Economic Strategy paper, AES, on similar lines. Two countries have decided to re-engage talks on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement, CECA. The talks started in 2011, last being in 2015. Now let's come to an India economic strategy to 2035. It is a three pillar strategy with focus on building a success. Uh, on building a sustainable long-term economic strategy. It identifies 10 sectors and 10 states in Indian market where Australia has competitive advantages and where it should focus its efforts. These are divided into a flagship sector, education, three lead sectors, agri-business, 
resources and tourism and six promising sectors energy health financial services infrastructure sport science and innovation three pillars include economic ties geostrategic engagement and rethinking culture thrust on soft power diplomacy some concerns in india australia relations comprehensive economic cooperation agreement ceca still remains inconclusive after nine rounds of negotiations india opted out from regional comprehensive economic partnership rcep among other things india and australia could not agree regarding market access over agriculture and dairy products australia's economy is heavily dependent on china with china being australia's largest trading partner accounting for 26% of its trade with the world now let's come to defense and security cooperation civil nuclear cooperation agreement was signed in 2014 between the two countries enabling india to secure uranium from australia Both also signed Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty (MLAT), Extradition Treaty, and the Social Security Agreement. Maritime security cooperation is seen in the form of joint exercises like OSINDEX 2019 (AUSINDEX), then OSTRAHIND (AUSTRAHIND). exercise speech black and kakadu biennial exercise hoisted hosted by the australian navy now let's come to science and technology and australia india strategic research fund was established in 2006 for scientists to collaborate on leading edge research Agreement on cyber and cyber enabled critical technology was signed recently to promote cooperation in the areas of digital economy, cyber security, critical and emerging technologies. Global cooperation. Chinese aggression and assertive foreign policy are common concerns and has brought both the democracies together or closer both have shared interest in vision of a free open inclusive and rules based indo pacific region australia's pacific step up and india's forum for india pacific islands cooperation fi pic reaffirm their cooperation in the south pacific region both cooperate in various multilateral fora including quad quad security dialogue indian ocean rim association iora asean regional forum asean uh, g20 east asia summits etc now let's come to people to people relations indian diaspora estimated at nearly 7 lakh is the fastest growing in australia and has become positive factor in bilateral relations almost 1 lakh indian students enrolled for studying in australia under new colombo plan which aims at increasing exchange in the indo pacific region of australian government uh australian undergraduates have studied and completed internships in india australia agreed to help in establishing a world class sports university in india now let's come to conclusion the prospects for bilateral relation 
uh, for bilateral relationship are recognized in both countries as strategically useful economically productive and aligned with each other's new agenda however it is recognized that the natural synergy has so far not been exploited fully uh, countries should conclude ceca at the earliest to realize the economic opportunities however it is recognized that the natural synergy has so far not been exploited fully. Countries should conclude CECA at the earliest to realize the economic opportunities. Based on the several commonalities and closely aligned values and principles of democracy, liberty, the rule of law, human rights, freedom of speech, free press and multiculturalism, both shall enhance the bilateral relationship by expanding engagement in various sectors like defense industry and commercial cyber activity, etc. Now let's come to the next topic, that is e-diplomacy. Why was this in news? The first ever India-Australia virtual summit in the wake of COVID-19 crisis has brought the concept of e-diplomacy to limelight. Uh, more on news. Globally, many nations have taken to e-diplomacy routes to keep the momentum of foreign relations going amid COVID-19. Other recent summits like Extraordinary Virtual G20 Leaders Summit, SARG Virtual Summit, Non-Aligned Movement Summit have been held virtually. About e-diplomacy. E-diplomacy is the use of internet and communication technologies by nations to define and establish diplomatic goals and objectives and to efficiently carry out the functions of diplomats. These functions include these functions include representation and promotion of the home nation, establishing both bilateral and multilateral relations, consular services and social engagement. What are the advantages? Continuum of diplomacy and physical safety in extraordinary situations. In times of crisis like the ongoing pandemic, e-diplomacy mitigates the physical contact between leaders and ensures their safety along with progressing diplomatic talks. Economically prudent. This also saves huge amounts of national money by omitting costly travels and lavish events uh, efficient time utilization reduced travel time also allows the diplomats to invest more time in policy making and better engagement strategies much of foreign ministries energy goes into organizing visits but the follow-up has always been hard virtual diplomacy makes high level engagement less burdensome so what are the challenges of e-diplomacy the first one would be decreased productivity e-diplomacy cannot replace face-to-face -face interactions backdoor consultations and negotiations that form the heart and soul of traditional diplomacy Virtual summits cannot fulfill the broader political goals and bigger objectives in minds of the heads of states. Major big breakthroughs or deals requiring direct intervention of leaders may not materialize. Virtual summit could reduce the spontaneity and candor of conversations. 
It is arguable whether new ideas or proposals which entail geostrategic alignments can emanate out of e-summits. Cyber security issues. Cyber crimes like hacking, threat of classified and sensitive information leaking may threaten national security. Yes, this is a very huge concern. Now let's come to the conclusion. Despite limitations and being in initial stages, e-diplomacy can act as a persuasive and timely supplement to traditional diplomacy. Countries can utilize this opportunity to incorporate e-diplomacy into follow-up discussions for increased interaction and engagements and furthering the goals of diplomacy. Now let's come to the next topic, that is India's energy cooperation with neighboring countries. So why was this in news? Recently, India and Bhutan signed a pact for first joint venture hydropower project. More on news, the 600 megawatt Kolongju project is part of four projects agreed in 2008, other three being Bunakha, Wangju and Jamkharju. It is a 50 it is a 50-50 joint venture between Satlaj Jal Vidyut Nigam, Himachal Pradesh PSU and Bhutanese Druk Green Power Corporation. Guidelines for import or export cross-border of electricity 2018 issued by the Ministry of Power facilitates import or export of electricity between India and neighboring countries. India's energy cooperation with neighboring countries. Now first let's come to India and Bhutan. Both countries signed India and Bhutan Framework Agreement on Hydropower Development and Trade in 2006 to develop 10,000 megawatt of hydropower by 2020. Key projects include Tala Hydropower Project 1,020 megawatt and Dorjilung Hydropower Project 1,125 megawatt. Trilateral cooperation between Bhutan, India and Bangladesh. India-Nepal electricity trade. Both signed power trade agreement in 2014 that commits both countries to buy and sell electricity during times of shortages. There are 22 cross-border power exchange facilities operational between the two. Mahakali Treaty was signed in 1996 for development of Pancheshwar Multipurpose Project. Now let's come to India-Bangladesh Electricity Trade. MOU was signed in 2010 between the two for bilateral cooperation in the areas of power and establishment of grid connectivity. India currently supplies about 1,200 megawatt power to Bangladesh to be increased to over 2,500 megawatt by 2021. Some successful regional energy cooperation arrangements across the world. The first one is Greater Mekong sub region comprising Cambodia, China, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand and Vietnam, had an estimated saving of $14.3 billion due to the substitution of fossil fuel generation with electricity.
Southern African Power Pool is an international power pool in 12 African countries that aims at providing reliable and economical electricity supply to the consumers in the region. The third one is the Nordic Pool, Israel's first international exchange for power trading and sourcing power from different sources like hydro, thermal, nuclear, wind and solar, etc. Now let's come to India and Myanmar. Currently, interconnection transmission line from more which is in manipur to tamu which is in myanmar transports electricity from india to myanmar now let's come to the benefit of energy cooperation with neighboring countries so the first benefit would be Utilization of untapped hydropower potential. Hydropower potential in Bhutan and Nepal together is 1,13,000 MW and in Northeast India is 58,000 MW. Next benefit would be effective use of seasonal complementarities. During winter, when the run of rivers become dry, Bhutan and Nepal import electricity from India. When other renewable resources are less potent, like solar energy, during monsoon in India, harnessing hydropower will help to meet required demand in such time period. The third advantage or benefit would be reduced dependency on fossil fuels. Harnessing potential of hydropower will reduce dependence on fossil fuels to generate electricity. It is estimated that India alone can reduce 35,000 megawatt of coal-fired power plants construction during 2015 to 2040 period if the potential for cross-border electricity trade is effectively exploited. Environmental benefits. It is estimated that India can reduce 6.5% of power sector carbon dioxide emissions during the 2015 to 2040 period if the potential for cross-border electricity trade is effectively exploited. Create investment opportunities. Creating cross-border interconnected systems will require strengthening the existing generation, transmission and distribution network across countries. This will create substantial investment opportunities where private sector can participate. Economic and financial gains. Providing stable electricity supply to the consumers across borders will promote industrial and commercial activities which in turn will lead to significant economic gains. Economies of scale a regional approach brings the desired economies of scale and hence lowers or lowers the cost of electricity generation. Before we come to challenges, let's read the multilateral initiatives in South Asia for energy cooperation. South Asia Regional Initiative for Energy Integration, SARI or EI, was launched in 2000 to promote energy security through increased trade, investment and access to clean sources of power and fuel. It covers eight countries uh, like, Af like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. SARC Framework Agreement for Energy Cooperation Electricity was signed by all member states of SARC in 2014 to facilitate integrated operation of regional grid across SARC. South Asia Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation SASEC 
Operational Plan 2016 to 2025 identifies energy as one of the four priority sectors for partnership among SASEC members, that is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Challenges in cross-border electricity transmission. The first one is policy challenges. Lack of harmonious policy framework is a major hurdle towards development of a trans-border regional power market. Example, national electricity policies do not have dedicated focus on development of a competitive market across neighboring regions. The second challenge is infrastructural or technical constraints. Absence of any grid discipline in cross-border electricity trade. Limited transmission network for cross-border electricity trade and significant TND losses act as constraints. The third being political challenges. Political stability and national security are a major cause of concern like tariff fixation has political backlashes, hence fixation of uniform tariff for electricity trade could be challenging. Investment challenges or financial constraints Given the poor financial conditions of the state-owned utilities, investment has to be pumped in by the private sector with emphasis on foreign direct investment, that is FDI, to develop hydropower projects. So what is the way forward? The first one is ensuring energy availability and effective use of cross-border electricity transmission requires harmonious policy framework, cross-border steering committee and independent multilateral regulatory body. To exploit available hydropower potential in reason, private investment should be promoted, though foreign direct investment, FDI, and more financial assistance from multilateral financial institutions. A common platform should be formed for periodic knowledge exchange amongst the policy makers regulators, subject matter experts, research institutions, civil society organizations, and media. Now let's come to the next topic, that is India, elected non-permanent member of UN Security Council, that is the UNSC. Now the UN Security Council members. It has five permanent members who has veto powers and they are US, China, UK, Russia and France. And there are ten permanent and there are ten non permanent members who has no veto powers. So they are from Africa, Asia, Latin America and Caribbean, then to Western to Europe, Eastern Europe. So from here there will be 10 non-permanent members. 2 from Africa, 3 from Asia, 2 from Latin America and Caribbean, then another 2 from Western Europe and 1 from Eastern Europe. So, each year, the General Assembly elects five non-permanent members for a two-year term by a two-thirds majority. A retiring member is not eligible for immediate re-election. The election is held by secret ballot and there are no nominations. 
the 10 non-permanent seats are distributed on a regional basis. Five from African and Asian states, two from Latin American states, one from Eastern European states, and two from Western European and other states. So, why was this in news? India has been elected as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for a two-year term. More on news. India, the only endorsed candidate from the Asia-Pacific states, won 184 votes out of the 192 ballot cast in the elections. India's two-year term as the non-permanent member of the UNSC would begin from January 1st, 2021. It will be India's eighth term as non-permanent member at the UNSC. Previously, India was elected for 19 50 to 1951, 1967 to 1968, 1972 to 1973, 1977 to 1978, 1984 to 1985, 1991 to 1992, and most importantly, in 2011 to 2012. Along with India, Ireland, Mexico and Norway also won the Security Council elections for the non-permanent membership. India's Priorities at UNSC During the election campaign at UNSC, Ministry of External Affairs launched a brochure. So they launched a brochure outlining India's priorities. According to it, India will be guided by the five priorities under the overarching uh, theme of norms, new orientation for a reformed multilateral system. These priorities include According to it, India will be guided by the five priorities under the overarching theme of norms, new orientation for a reformed multilateral system. These priorities include new opportunities for progress as a rule abiding democracy and a positive contributor to the security of the global commons india will work constructively with partners to bring innovative and inclusive solutions to foster development for greater involvement of women and youth to shape a new paradigm for a coherent, pragmatic, nimble and effective platform for collaboration to ensure sustainable peace in a rapidly shifting global security landscape. The second one is an effective response to international terrorism. India will pursue concrete and result-oriented action by the Council aimed at addressing the abuse of ICT by terrorists, disrupting their nexus with sponsors and transnational organized criminal entities, stemming the flow of terror finance, strengthening normative and operative frameworks for greater cooperation with other multilateral forums. The third one is reforming the multilateral system. Widespread concern at the inadequacy of the existing multilateral institutions to deliver results or meet new challenges. Reformed multilateralism, a must for the post-COVID-19 era. A first and vital step in the reform of the Security Council, it must reflect contemporary realities to be more effective. A comprehensive, the next point is a comprehensive approach to international peace and security.
India's vision for international peace and security is guided by dialogue and cooperation, mutual respect and commitment to international law. Streamlining UN peacekeeping is an overdue task. Greater clarity, direction and professionalism in US peacekeeping operations must be okay in UN peacekeeping operations must be ensured. Promoting technology and the next point is promoting technology with a human touch as a driver of solutions. India will encourage partnerships to harness the benefits of technological innovation to reduce human suffering, enhance ease of living, build resilient communities. India will pursue these priorities through a 5S approach. Samman, that is respect. Samvad, that is dialogue. Then Sahayog, cooperation. Shanti, that is peace. And Samridhi, that is prosperity. Now let's come to the next topic, the fifth topic, that is European Union. Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, EVFTA. So why is this in news? Vietnam's National Assembly ratified the European Union Vietnam Free Trade Agreement and the EU Vietnam Investment Protection Agreement, paving the way for it to take effect. More on news. EVFTA is the second FTA between the EU and an ASEAN country after Singapore. So the first one was Singapore and now the next is Vietnam. It would abolish 99% of custom duties, eliminate bureaucratic hurdles by aligning regulatory standards for goods like cars and medicines and ensure easier market access for both European and Vietnamese companies. This is the first FDA that has been signed after the outbreak of the global COVID-19 pandemic that has resulted in a disruption of supply chains. EVIPA a part of a three a part of a free trade agreement that is FTA is an agreement between EU and Vietnam which aims to protect investors and investments in a host country. In many segments India is closely competing with Vietnam. Since Vietnam has signed an FTA, India will have to face major impacts in those segments over a period of time. So, what are the impact on India? Impact on domestic industries in many sectors. For example, in apparel sector, India needs to pay 9% in the EU, while Vietnam will not pay any duty. Similar impacts would be seen in sectors like footwear and fishing. Shift in investments. Vietnam has emerged as a preferred destination of any foreign companies wanting to invest in Asia due to low labor cost. So Vietnam has low labor cost. According to a recent report by Japanese Investment Bank, out of 56 companies that relocated out of China between April 2018, and August 2019, 26 decided to set up their new base in Vietnam. Also due to EVIPA, Vietnam will be attracting a lot of investments moving out of China, particularly, particularly those with the EU as their market. The next impact on India would be Coupling with other FTEs, European producers can invest in Vietnam and from there they can export further into other markets in Asia-Pacific, including a market in China because China and Vietnam are going to be part of a major FTA through the forthcoming Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership 
that is RCEP. So what is the way forward? Concluding India EU FTA. India can't nullify this advantage by concluding its own FTA stalled with EU since 2007. A FTA may be the next big leap after the 1991 liberalization policy that India needs to hurdle towards its target of becoming a $5 trillion economy. The next way forward would be labor reforms. Vietnam has already ratified six of the eight international labor organization standards. India can bring labor reforms as soon as possible to end the stalemates in potential FTAs. Quality standards. The best way forward in short term should be to Undertake a comparative study of non-tariff measures such as quality standard. The last way forward would be commodity specific agreement. In the long term, commodity focused trade agreements can be a solution wherein a post facto analysis must be done to analyze whether the FTA brought the anticipated effect on the export of said commodity or not. So that's all for now. Bye guys.